Right. Um, greeting viewers. Thank you for joining us. Columbia Global Centers Nairobi warmly welcomes all the members of our audience to the continuation of our African Book Talk series. Columbia Global Centers Nairobi is part of nine regional hubs positioned around the world by Columbia University. The centers serve as platforms for dialogue and the exchange of knowledge in research, education, as well as public programming. Thank you for joining us to yet another riveting show. We continue to push boundaries by focusing more on subjects that are personal to us, that resonate with people in the continent of Africa. I'm looking forward to today's dialogue and I know you are too. A lot has been written about women, but I think not so much about our focus of discussion today. We picture the African woman working tirelessly to take care of her family, or in the modern world, to build her career or to get edu more educated. In our show today, we will be informed about yet another aspect of their lives through the book, The Sex Lives of African Women, with author and our very special guest today, Nana Dakoa Sekiyama. Nana is a feminist activist, writer, and blogger. She is the co-founder of Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women, an award-winning website, podcast, and festival that publishes and creates content that tells stories of African women's experiences around sex, sexuality, and pleasure. She is also the founder of Makeda PR, a communications company that works to amplify the work of feminist movements globally. Nana is a recipient of the prestigious Hedgebrook Fellowship. She lives in Accra, Ghana. Hassan Gedi Santur will be moderating this session. Hassan is a writer and editor. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Yahoo News, and CBC Radio, among others. He is the author of novels, Something Remains, and The Youth of God, and the non-fictional book, Maps of Exile. He's currently work, working on his third novel, Imagined Lives. We will post their extended bios in the chat area for your reference. To our audience, kindly note the program will be recorded and will be uploaded on our YouTube channel in the next seven days or so. As we proceed, kindly remember to post your questions under the Q&A section. For more informative programs, remember to follow us on social media. Sandra is posting social, our social media handles in the chat area. Hassan, you're most welcome to take it from here. Thank you so much. I appreciate that warm welcome. Uh, hi, Nana. Welcome to the African Book Talk series. Hi, Hassan. It's a delight to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with you uh, about this marvelous book, uh, which I came across uh, in April. And as soon as I read the prologue, I instantly knew that I wanted to talk to you. Uh, it's a brave and important and a trailblazing book. And I, and I think I speak for a lot of Africans when I say this is the kind of book that we've been waiting for for a long time. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It means the world to me to have you say that. Yeah. And before we start our conversation, uh, can you read uh, for us the prologue chapter? It's very short um, to give the audience a taste of what you, well, their info when they get their own copy. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Happy to do so. For over 10 years, I have shared my personal experiences of sex through Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women, a blog I co-founded with my friend Malika Grant. I have also facilitated conversations about women's experiences of sex and pleasure in a variety of public settings, ranging from intimate living room conversations in Mombasa, Kenya, to public events in Berlin, Germany. I have often spoken and written about the importance of owning one's body and my continuing journey 
and negotiating my sexuality and desires both within and outside the bedroom. Speaking in public about a subject which is often deemed taboo, especially in the part of the world where I originate, is a political act. I think and write about sex in order to learn how to have better sex. I encourage other women to share the experiences of sex in order to build a collective consciousness around the politics of pleasure. This is critical in a world where women too often lack access to truly comprehensive sexuality education. Black, African, and Afro-descendant women are often told that sex should only be, with, be within particular constraints. Between people of opposite genders, for instance, and within certain parameters. In some countries, those parameters are marriage. In other countries, the law prohibits some types of sexual acts or tries to control the choices girls and women have when they experience an unwanted pregnancy. In the sex lives of African women, individual women from across the African continent and its global diaspora speak to the experiences of sex, sexualities, and relationships. These stories are based on in-depth interviews I conducted between 2015 and 2020 with women from 31 countries. A significant proportion of the women I interviewed represented more than one nation and had had their sexual encounters shaped by the various countries they had lived in and cultures they had experienced. After speaking to over 30 women for this book, I started to see several common threads weaving through the stories. We are all on a journey towards sexual freedom and agency. In order to get there, we need to heal. Healing looks different for everybody. For some, healing came about through celibacy and spiritual growth. For others, healing came, back, came through taking back power as a dominatrix and sex worker. Many of the women I spoke to inspired me with the realities of how they lived their best sexual lives. This included deeply personal stories, for example, about navigating freedom and polyamory in conservative Senegal, or resisting the erasure of lesbian identity and finding a queer community in Egypt in the midst of a revolution. African women grapple with the trauma of sexual abuse and resist religious and patriarchal edicts in order to assert their sexual power and agency. They do this by questioning and resisting societal norms while creating new norms and narratives that allow them to be who they truly are. The journey to our sexual freedom is not a linear one or one that is fixed and static. Freedom is a state that we are constantly seeking to reach. Thank you so much uh, for that beautiful reading. Um, Something just jumped at me as you were reading that. And uh, when you say that uh, speaking and writing about sex and specifically female sexuality is a political act, uh, I find that uh, a really powerful concept. Can you elaborate on that idea? Was, was that uh, something that you've always felt or is it something that sort of came to you over time? This realization that it is a political act. <laughs> yes, the realization that speaking about sex is a political act came to me over a period of time when I myself started to write about sex, right? And even making that decision to write publicly about sex, about my sexual experiences was one that I knew would mark me out. I knew it would be one that meant that certain opportunities in life that I wanted to pursue, I could no longer pursue. For instance, believe it or not, I used to want to be a politician and to participate in like mainstream politics, right? And that was something I thought about when I was deciding to write about sex. I thought, wow, women politicians get a lot of flack for anything that seems out of the norm when it comes to their sexuality. You know, even being a single mother is grounds for censure. And what about being a single woman who is choosing to have sex with whoever she wants to have sex with, right? I knew that would eliminate that <laughs> prospect for me, you know, um, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, this is really important. I think it's important for us to talk about sex. I think mm -hmm. actually the subjects we are often told not to discuss. Sex is one example. Money is another example. You know, those are the subjects that actually, in a sense, you have particular forces, particular systems at play 
wanting to maintain a certain a certain status quo and talking mm -hmm. and discussing i think allows you to question i think it allows you to dismantle and so you're told not to talk about it because you're supposed to accept it as the way it is and so once you start to speak about it and encourage other people to speak about it i think people start to question mm -hmm. you know what the experiences are and start to think actually maybe this box i've always been told to play within this is not the box i want to play within you know in fact i want to throw away the block box completely and i think that's an act of that's an act of politics right because that's you saying i don't want to go by the status quo i want to figure mm -hmm. things out i don't want to just accept what i've been told mm -hmm. but uh, i also think that another thing that makes this book political and even radical i would say is that it centers women's sexual pleasure uh, yes. right at the center of the narrative and in a content that's often religious, conservative, patriarchal. Would, would you agree with that? No, absolutely, right? And again, when it comes to sex, especially for African women, we're never raised to think of, oh, you should have sex or you can have sex because it's good. You know, mm -hmm. we're told, you know, sex is something that you do in order to have children. It's something that you do in order to satisfy your husband, in order to keep your husband. We're never told, for example, you can have sex with anybody. You can have sex with somebody who's the same gender as you are. You can have sex just because it feels good, just because you want to, right? So that's also the other aspect of, you know, saying pleasurable sex, you know, mm -hmm. and sex for the sheer joy of it is also political. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's go back to the beginning. What was the genesis of the book? How did the idea actually come to you? Did you have an aha moment? <laughs> I think I had several aha moments, right? So my friend Malaika and I started blogging about sex since 2009. And mm -hmm. over a period of time, one of the things I realized was the stories that we had on the blog, I felt were way more interesting than anything I ever read in the public domain when it came to African women's um, experiences of sex and sexuality. I felt like, you know, especially in Western mainstream media, were usually portrayed as women who were vectors of, vectors of diseases like HIV and AIDS without an awareness that you could have a chronic illness and still live a full life and still be happy, you know, or we'd experience FGM uh, or, you know, female circumcision. And if you had, you could never experience pleasure or were women who were constantly pregnant or were women who were unhappy in polygamous, polygamous marriages. And those felt to me very much like incomplete stories, right? And I thought, okay, the way for me to get a sense of what a fuller story would be, would actually be to interview as many African women as possible and hear from them. And so when I decided to do this book project, I initially had a very, very utopian dream. I wanted to interview an African woman from every country on the continent. <laughs> You know, and I also wanted to do these interviews face to face, which was not realistic. <laughs> exactly. And so, yes, at some point in time, I just decided to go for as much breath as possible, but obviously cap the number because one has to. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I think one of the remarkable qualities of the book is that um, is the sheer diversity of the stories that you tell. Uh, when you were in the process of writing a book, did, did you uh, did you have a clear idea that you wanted to tell the stories of not only straight women uh, or queer women and disabled women and celibate women? I mean, it's just remarkable that the range of stories. Yes, that was very intentional because for me, I wanted to get the widest possible spectrum of stories, right? Mm -hmm. And so I did want to uh, interview women who had a variety of experiences, came from a different from different backgrounds. You know, um, I definitely wanted to interview women who were cis as well as women who were trans, women with different abilities. Um, I wanted the whole range. Yeah. 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 Because even within sort of the, the umbrella of queer women that you, you feature in the, there, there's a quite a variety. Of, in the, and there's uh, a lot of actually, I do want to ask you a question about labels and, and, and mm. uh, because that's one thing that I that really sort of. Uh, struck me was the, the incredible variety of ways that these women, after many years of doing the work as the saying goes, mm -hmm. have come to adopt. Can you talk yes. a little bit about the, 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 just the range of, um, of ways that people identify in, in this book? Yes. So one of the really initial questions I'd ask anybody I interviewed mm -hmm. was, how do you identify in terms of your gender and in terms of your sexuality? And people's responses were interesting, right? Some people would say, 
I, ident I identify as, you know, a woman who loves women. Somebody will say I identify as a same gender loving person. Somebody will say I identify as pansexual. Somebody will say I identify as a lesbian. Someone will say I identify as a black lesbian or a queer lesbian, you know? So it, it was really interesting to me because for me, I think it speaks to the, exp again, the expansiveness of sexuality. Even mm -hmm. if someone identifies as queer, there may be a particular identity that they resonate with for a variety of reasons, right? They may mm -hmm. feel a more, a more accurately describes who they are or a more accurately describes who they are in this moment, right? Some people said, I used to identify as X and now I identify as Y. Um, mm. And for me, that was also really beautiful. Mm. It's actually one of the things I find really most refreshing about the book is the, is the and I'm sure this will, you know, um, as, as the book finds wider audience across Africa, this will, um, uh, you know, ruffle a few feathers, but <laughs> the idea of, um, you know, sexual orientation and identification uh, it's it's so so just sort of um, this just sheer variety of it. And after reading the book, it struck me that the notion that sexuality is this fixed identity that just sort of stays the same throughout one's life begins to seem just inauthentic to the lived experiences of so many people. Absolutely. I mean, if we think of ourselves, we're human beings. We're dynamic. We grow. We change. We evolve. You know, mm. who we are today will hopefully not be who we are in five or 10 years. Why mm. should our sexuality remain fixed and static? You know, it's mm. only, I think it only makes sense that our sexuality will also continue to evolve. And I think it's beautiful if we can allow ourselves, right, to change and to, mm. yeah, to find different forms and, and just to have the flexibility to be who we feel we are at this moment in time and not feel like we need to stay that person forever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just sort of to not to switch um, too much, but I, I think for me, one of the aspects of the book that really shocked me was the reoccurring theme of, of childhood sexual abuse and trauma mm -hmm. as, a, as a common experience for uh, many African women. Mm -hmm. I guess intellectually, I must have known that this is a common thing that happens all over the world, but just to, to be confronted with the ubiquity of it in the book uh, and how it reverberates that, that traumatic experience throughout you know, so many women's lives in this book is quite heartbreaking and infuriating actually. No, I mean, I felt absolutely the same thing, right? I think it's one thing to know something intellectually mm. and it's one thing to hear it over and over again. And you're just like, wow, this is mm. a real pandemic. This is a real problem that nobody is really addressing and nobody is really trying to solve you know um, and that was heartbreaking that was difficult I mm. also realized at some point in time that I was asking people a question that was in a sense prompting people to tell me about the experiences of child sexual abuse mm -hmm. and at some point in time to be honest I stopped asking that question because it was a lot to hear over and over again mm -hmm. so you know there are also some women that I interviewed who probably didn't say anything about child sexual abuse and it doesn't mean they didn't experience child sexual abuse. So it is a ubiquitous problem um, and a real issue that I think, you know, everybody needs to be aware of. And it's something that it's, it's part of the violence that women, at least in this case, because I was interviewing women experienced, right? And I think it's something that we all need to find mm. ways to address, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. But also I think one of the things that really comes across is that it's not just an event that that took place you know when you were five or eight or 20 it it actually reverberates and has massive impact on the 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 mental health and sexual mm -hmm. health of these women can you talk about the just sort of how it's just not the way that many people sort of see it is like well that's horrible that it happened but you were 10 and now you're 35 or yeah 30, or whatever it is that you know yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think just from interviewing the range of women that I interviewed, it's very clear that child sexual abuse, experiences of child sexual abuse for the vast majority of women, you know, mm. continues to have a detriment, detrimental, I can't speak, a, detriment, a detrimental impact, you know, mm. on, on their life, on their ability to take pleasure in their bodies um, and, mm. and how they move through the world. I think for me, what I found heartwarming was 
how a lot of women were conscious of this and were dealing with this in a variety of ways, right? So there was a case of Salma, for example, and it's that experience of abuse. Um, and for her, it wasn't even being abused as a child, but being um, sexually assaulted as an adult that inspired her to become an activist, right? Um, and for some people, they've also made conscious efforts to heal. And again, healing also looks very different for everybody. So for me, that was hard woman because I felt like in most cases, it wasn't like something that people have just, you know, placed in the box, threw in the box away and are not dealing with it, but had found ways to deal with it. And we're also finding ways to still live full, healthy lives and mm -hmm. to take back their power, including sexual power, right? Because that's mm -hmm. part of what being sexually abused as a child does to you, I believe. I think it takes away a lot of power from you. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And it's, yeah, you're right that the, the healing that uh, a lot of these women go uh, on this journey of healing is so different. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, there was, I forgot her name, there's a woman who actually as part of dealing with all, you know, her sexuality is to be celibate, which I found yes. really quite interesting. Yes, that was Shanita. And so Shanita initially decided she was going to do 100 days of self-love. And for her, the practice of 100 days of self-love included being celibate, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, just focusing on herself, eating healthy food. Um, but it was really because she wanted to understand why her relationships were always ending. She was never really getting the sort of type of relationship that she wanted. And 100 days of celibacy was so helpful for her healing process that she decided to extend it to 1,000 days, right? And in that time, you know, she also rewarded herself. She decided to take a solo trip, which was something she had never done. And also as a single mom, that was a big thing for her to do, but she decided to get support and someone to care for her child and then to take time and go on the solo trip of a lifetime, which for me was also really beautiful and inspiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a little while ago, we were talking about, you know, um, you know the impact of, of uh, sexual abuse on a lot of these women and how sometimes, you know, silence makes it even worse. Uh, and I think one of the things that makes this book quite powerful is that it, it is, um, it makes the case without even trying, it makes a case for the healing power of sharing stories and experiences. Um, and that's something that you also, uh, I think in the prologue or somewhere in the book, you mentioned that at some point you had to include yourself in this book. Can you talk about why, what that journey to finally saying, I can't really do this without including myself? <laughs> yeah, no, when I started the book, I hadn't like thought I would include my own story. But after speaking to, you know, when I was like sort of halfway through my process, I thought, it's not fair. You can't like interview everybody else and put their business out there without putting your business out there as well, right? So for me, that became like an important part of the process. And also because a lot of women, when they would tell me an experience they've had, especially, for example, an experience of child sexual abuse, they would say to me, you're the very first person I've told this. I've never told anybody this before. And there was a bravery and vulnerability there that I really admired. And I thought, yeah, I need to also, I also need to respond, you know, similarly. I also need to share my own story. It's not like, you know, these women I'm speaking to are, in a sense, these subjects out there, you know, this is part of the collective process. And I not, also feel like, this is not say that again. This is not an anthropological. Exactly, project. exactly. Very much so. It's not an anthropological project. Yeah. You know, I am also the, in a sense, my own subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And because again, people are, are so generous with their stories and so vulnerable, uh, what, have been sort of the reactions have uh, from readers in terms of responding to this book? What were sort of, are there some running themes that are common in the, the, the reactions that you get? Yes. You know, one of the, I think the things, one of the favorite comments that I get is actually from a lot of people who identify as queer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them say to me, I've never felt so seen in my life. Mm -hmm. And that is really heartwarming. I've also had people tell me, even like today, someone DM'd me and was like, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for this book. You know, I promise I am going to like really think about my sexuality. I've also had people say that to me, like, you know, this book is making me question my sexuality, it's making me question my sexual orientation, it's making me realize, you know, there's so much that I want to explore and I haven't, you know, it's not too late, I can start at any age. And, and that's been 
just heartwarming you know that's the word i keep using over and over again yeah it must be very gratifying <laughs> it is it really is yes yeah uh, and you also organized the book into three main themes self-discovery freedom and healing um and i could see that sort of uh, the, the relationship be be between all three was this something that you came to as you were organizing and editing the book or was that always going to be a part of the, the sort of the, the arc of the book no, that was something that, again, I realized halfway through the process. So halfway through the process, you know, I did the spreadsheet where I'll put everybody's name or their pseudonym, the countries, their age, because I was really trying to make sure I was getting that spread of stories. And I started to write down for each woman's story the words that would come to my mind when I thought about their story. Mm -hmm. And then I realized there were a couple of strong themes that were really coming across. There was the theme that was really about you know, going on a journey, discovering yourself, figuring things out, you know, travel. And then I realized, okay, all of these stories seem to fit into, you know, a broad theme around discovery. Um, and then I realized that there was also a lot of stories that were around either experiences of healing or frankly, experiences that people still needed to heal from, you know? And then they were like, so that was, okay. I'm like, okay, so there's a, going to be a section around healing. And then there were stories where I was like, oh my God, these people, I want to be them. You know, they figured it out. They live their best sex lives. And I really felt those stories epitomized freedom. And so, you know, those are some of the stories that went into the freedom section. Mm -hmm. Saying that, of course, there's some stories where it's like, should they go here? Should they go there? You know, it mm -hmm. kind of cuts across. Like we know life is fluid. We all kind of mm -hmm. are at various intersections. Mm -hmm. And so, the US version is actually a bit different from the UK version <laughs> in terms of how some of the stories are arranged. Um, so yeah, for folks who read both, I'd love to, to hear where people would put some of the stories. Mm, okay, excellent. Um, and, and do you feel like that's also the, you know, the, these three main themes are also sort of um, that in your story, when you think about your own story and your own journey, would you say that that theme you, would one of them like would, would you identify one of them as more sort of that's my theme kind of thing that's my <laughs> struggle yes. in terms of the story that i told for this book right mm -hmm. um so just to give a bit of maybe context into my own story mm -hmm. when i started to write my own story i was struggling i really didn't know what to write or what to say right and then I decided to follow the same process I'd followed for everybody else. So I actually asked a friend of mine to interview me. And I was really surprised, yeah, that what came out when I spoke to her was actually my own experience of child sexual abuse, which I have written about before, but very briefly, I didn't feel there was anything else I wanted to say or reflect on, but that was really what came out. Mm -hmm. So then my story went into the healing section because that's really what came out when, you know, I was interviewed. Um, so I feel like in terms of the story that I told, it was really more about healing than, you know, about self-discovery or freedom, even though I would say, you know, part of my process over the past, gosh, over a decade now has really been a journey of discovery. Yeah. And that comes through in your section, actually, as you can see. Oh, good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, and also having traveled around Africa and spoken to so many African women about sex, um, what's your assessment in terms of where we are as a continent when it comes to, you know, uh, sex education that is honest and comprehensive, and it's not just about sort of the biology of sex, like, where are we? I have a feeling what you're going to say, but I, I want to hear <laughs> I mean, I feel like in the formal sector, you know, in our public institutions, in our schools, in our churches, it's not really changed, right? It's not. What we're still told about sex, if we are told anything, is really limited to our biological functions. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I feel like the religious influence is still very strong. People are usually just told, don't do it without much of a discussion of what it is. Or, mm -hmm. And somehow people are also then expected to get married by a certain age and then produce children, right? Um, and in some contexts, I think what we're also seeing is a real backlash against the idea of comprehensive sex education in my own country, Ghana. That's an example where the government tried to in introduce comprehensive sex education 
and basically some far right civil society organizations and religious leaders were like, no, all you're trying to do is convert our children to homosexuality, you know, without a recognition that actually in our traditional societies, our understanding of gender and sexuality was a lot more fluid than what the colonizers brought in, right? And it's rather homophobia, <laughs> which is an African as opposed to homosexuality being an African. But then I think what you find in a lot of, especially digital, digital spaces, is a lot more communities, intentional created communities where people can learn about the whole spectrum of sex and sexuality. I think African feminists um, have been doing this. There are a range of platforms. Um, there are platforms like The Spread, like Hola Africa, you know, and then obviously a lot of work have also been done by some of the African feminist academics like Sylvia Tamale, who did the African Sexualities Reader. So there is a lot more material out there now um, than there was when I was growing up, for instance. But I'll say it's usually in the books and in the digital spaces. Mm -hmm. no, absolutely. Um, I, I have a couple of more questions, but I also want to make enough time. I want to make sure that we have enough time for um, questions coming to us from our audience. So let me, uh, we have two questions now. And so one is from an anonymous attendee uh, who says uh, that he or she really loved the book and uh, have recommended it widely to African women and men. Her question or his question uh, is, did you find difference between the stories you heard from women living in the con on the continent and those living in diaspora? Oh, that's <laughs> that was gonna be one of my questions. Yes, it's funny because actually this is a question that I've been asked quite a few times, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think people clearly expect there to be a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't find a huge difference because I think what a lot of, um, and I would say maybe a lot of the Africans I interviewed were in the diaspora were like second generation Africans, right? And mm -hmm. what I would tend to find is their parents were very much trying to raise them as if they were back home, wherever home was, right? Mm -hmm. So they're still being raised according to the norms of, of their original society. Probably the difference is, you know, um, the wider society may be a bit more, you know, open-minded and I don't want to use the word open-minded really but I have just used it <laughs> so maybe let, let me just That's say maybe, that we don't want <laughs> <laughs> yeah so maybe that maybe the wider society where they find themselves may especially on the books you know mm -hmm. have more openness around sex and sexuality but that was not necessary whether whether the, the people experienced at home right so there's that battle mm -hmm. between you know the external environment and what people are experiencing at home yeah that was sort of my yeah my biggest takeaway in terms of the difference between africans in the diaspora and on the continent absolutely and i think uh, as somebody who who was born in africa but grew up um in, in canada it, it's something that a lot of people don't appreciate especially people who haven't lived abroad is that sometimes when people move so far away from home uh, a lot of immigrant parents actually become so much more exactly you know, so much more somali so much more Kenyan. Yes. That's a way of holding on to their traditions and culture. So sometimes exactly. you can, you're actually living more, more strictly when you're there. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, because they are still living with whichever image of, you know, Malawi, Somalia they had in the 70s when they left, as opposed yeah. to how Malawi, Somalia, Ghana may be today. Yeah. Um, and we have another question from Emmanuel, um, who, uh, so this is the question. For most people in African society, gender sexual expression tends to be binary, the kind tied to or rather confirms the community's cultural expectations. Your book showcases how sexuality and expressions is more, uh, more than just binary. What do you think is the place, sorry, what do you think is the place such diverse and non-traditional modes of expressing sexuality has? in the African context where sex is not divorced from one's identity, both individually and within the community as a whole. What do you think is the next step to these avenues of sexual expressions in African settings, in an African setting um, that has remained static? Uh, yeah, so I, it sort of touches on something that we talked about, but I think there's still more to discuss there. Yeah, no, I'm happy to. And thank you, Mano, for this question. You know, I feel like, I'm not a historian. I love history, <laughs> but I'm not a historian and I'm definitely not an expert, right? 
But from what I know, I feel like the biggest changes that we had to our African so our gender and our sexuality actually came through colonization. And, you know, the new religions that were introduced to the continent, including Christianity and Islam, you know, mm-hmm. that was a huge change. Um, and I, my understanding is, our, you know, pre-colonial understandings of gender and sexuality was a lot more fluid. So we've actually had a change from being more fluid to being more static. I think we need to go back to being more fluid and more open. And as someone who lives on the continent, right, as someone who lives in Ghana specifically, where I'm seeing a lot of dynamism amongst like young people, queer people, particularly when it comes to sex and sexuality, you know, I think the place is right here, right? And it's for people to understand that, you know, our gender, our sexuality is not fixed, it's not binary, um, and we need to accept the openness and fluidity. It's part of the diversity of life, of diversity of society. Mm-hmm. And yeah, mm-hmm. it is what, that's what it is basically, yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Oh, we have another question from Kathy Cleary. Uh, what do you recommend uh, to a young African woman just coming of age? Uh, can she best, sorry, how can she best learn about her own sexuality? What can she read both online and on books and in books? Oh, that's a great question, which I really, really love, right? It makes me think like, what would I have wanted to be told about sex? And I think I would have, been, I would have wanted to be told, you know, that you can have sex for all sorts of reasons, including for pleasure. I would have wanted to be told you can have sex with yourself. You know, mm-hmm. like masturbation is a legitimate way to figure out your own body. And it's the safest way of having sex. Like, you know, that's what I would have loved to have been told. Like, spend some time exploring your body. There's no shame in it. You know, um, I would have wanted to be given books like um, The Quirky Quick Guide to Sex um, by my friend Tiffany Mugu, which I absolutely love. Like Dr. T's, um, Dr. T's Guide to Sexual Health, you know. Uh, and I would have liked to have had access to resources like my own blog, Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women, like Hola Africa. I'd have also liked to have been told, you don't need to rush to have sex, just like you can take your time, figure it out, and sex with yourself is legitimate. As opposed to you're being told you, don't, you shouldn't have sex. You see other people have sex and then you're kind of curious and you, know, you go and have terrible sexual experience, right? I would have wanted to feel like I could go to my mom and my auntie and ask mm-hmm. questions as opposed to this is something you just don't talk about mm-hmm. yeah absolutely yeah um i think you're completely right actually i think um you know i, I was thinking i was talking to somebody a while back about i really would not want to be a, a young sort of teenage person in this day and age because there's just so many conflicting messages you're getting especially if you come from a conservative culture where mm-hmm. on the one hand you're told don't do this you're going to die mm-hmm. if you do it you're going to mm-hmm. go to hell and then you see all around you, Instagram, everywhere, people just sort of looking like they're having sex every 10 minutes and <laughs> <laughs> getting, being given the impression that something is wrong with you if you're not doing that. Yes, exactly. Like, you know, the thing is, for me, sex positivity is not about having lots of sex, right? It's about being able to have a positive experience and understanding of sex right Mm -hmm. approaching it from a pleasure perspective as opposed to a fear-filled perspective it doesn't be it doesn't mean you should have lots of sex it really depends on you and what you want Mm -hmm. right um i think the important thing is being able to have the space and time to figure it out for yourself without Mm -hmm. pressure to be one way or the other yeah and i can put um the names of the books and blogs in the yeah, yeah, Kathy is just asking for that, so that would be actually quite helpful. Um, yeah, great. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm. I just wanted to say to those of us, uh, those of you who are watching, uh, if you have a question for Nana, please. We have uh, another uh, maybe 15 minutes or so before we have to wrap up. So get your questions in. In the meantime, I will continue with my question because I am not done yet. <laughs> um, so. Uh, you know, you, you spent all this time talking to all these women, um, so many stories you've collected, but I am sure there are even more stories of African women and their journeys. Uh, is there, have you sort of t- 
toyed with the idea or thought about maybe a, another volume? <laughs> yes. Um, I, I don't intend to do another volume, but I absolutely think there are so many more stories out there when it comes to, you know, this very subject. Um, but I'm not going to do another volume, but I am going to do another book about sex. So, and okay. I feel like my next book on sex will definitely be building on this book. So it'll be quite different in form and style, um, mm-hmm. but the subject matter is the same, yeah. Well, I know I was, I was just gonna recruit you, like I was gonna say, like since you were so good at doing this, maybe you can do one for African men as well. <laughs> Hassan, maybe you can do one for African men. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I can write too. Why not? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I I have one more question actually that I wanted to ask you, but let me see if we have. Oh, we have another question coming in, um, and Maxine wants to know: Is self pleasure such a must learn thing? I have tried learning how to master it, but I have just never been able. To, I've never seemed to enjoy it. A lot of my friends seem to have figured it out, but honestly. I just don't like it. What does, because does it mean I have a problem? Oh, no, thanks for that, Maxine. Um, first of all, I don't think you have a problem. I think there are lots of things that some people might like and others don't like. You know, at the same time, I also think that a lot of people have a lot of guilt about masturbation because we're told from a very young age, don't touch yourself what are you doing? It's a bad thing to touch yourself. Like there are pastors who preach against masturbation, you know? So I feel like it's worthwhile considering and, you know, it may be helpful to speak to a professional about this, like why, why maybe self-pleasure for you is not a thing, right? Like I'm saying, it could just be, it's not a thing, but I also like to recognize that sometimes we don't like certain things because of what we've been told about it and especially masturbation that's one of those things so that's the reason why i'm mentioning that you know um so on one hand i'm saying no i don't think it means you have a problem on the other hand i'm saying <laughs> yeah. you know maybe some of what you've been told like all of us have been told has given you a baggage around touching yourself and mm. it might be worthwhile yeah. to explore with a professional if that's the reason or it could be that you need to figure out different ways of touching yourself or use the toy to touch yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're you're absolutely right. I think it's really important that to first, before you even do anything else for for anybody who's feeling this way to actually really explore why it is that they, what is the root cause of of their discomfort or dislike. And, And maybe, yeah, it was the original message that they got that this is sin and this is terrible, don't do this. And that can be very hard to overcome, and that interferes with her ability or his ability to enjoy this. So, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, another question says, "What's your favorite part of your own sexual journey?" My favorite part of my own sexual journey is that the best is yet to come. <laughs> like I truly, truly, truly believe that. You yeah. know, some of my favorite interviews were with older women, and like there's this confidence that they have in their body, and also. Like if I think of my own sexual journey, I feel like sex has gotten better the older I've gotten because Mm -hmm. I'm more confident, I'm more like curious, I'm more willing to try new things. Mm -hmm. I'm getting to know my body better. Sex in my forties is definitely way better than it was in my Mm twenties. So that is the thing that for me is exciting, right? Like a journey doesn't need to end. And we all know that the best journeys, it's like the stops along the way that's more fun than finally getting to where you want to get to. Mm, yeah, absolutely. We have uh, another question. I'm going to read a couple of questions quickly because I, we have to wrap up soon. But we have uh, someone, um, she says, I am uh, Fatuma Keati, um, who's an assistant professor at um, uh, in at the university. Um, I don't know how to read this one, but I'm going to try it. University, the letters, the science, humanity, humanities at Bomako, Mali. When I looked at the African Anglophone and Francophone women's literature, sex issues and sexual scenes are dealt with um, with a lot of ambivalence and caution as if that issue was totally alien to African experience. Pleasure is almost absent as, as if sex was a duty. How do you explain this malaise of women to deal with 
this issue and deconstruct prejudices regarding women's sexuality? Wow, there's a Thank lot there. You. Yeah, there is a lot there. Thank you so much, Fatima, for mm -hmm. this question. Yeah. You know, and I very much agree with you. Like, I'm always so mystified when I'm reading a book. And, you know, it's like, somehow we know like two protagonists have had sex, but there's no description. And then it's kind of skipped over. Yeah. I mean, I think part of it is because of, sometimes I feel like the publishing industry actually is like still very conservative, you mm. know? And if you try and describe sex in an explicit way, it almost seems to put your book in a category where it's been labeled as pornographic or erotic, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, you're describing the human experience and this was a valid human experience. And so I think a lot of writers shy away from that because then they're worried their book is not going to be regarded as high literature, for instance. Yeah you know, um, and we'll just go to like the back of the bookshelves. Um, I feel like that's the reason, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, we have a couple of more comments and questions uh, when it's sort of uh, put in there before we have to go. Uh, we have another one from another Fatima um, and she says, from my experience, sex within African cultures is shrouded with shame and guilt. And what this book does is, uh, what this book does well is lifting that shame and guilt. How do we, how do you think we can continue to work in lifting the shame and guilt from sex on the, in the continent and in the diaspora, considering how difficult it is, uh, it is to do that for many due to cultural conditions, which is so powerful. Thank you, Fatima. I think we continue to lift the shame and guilt by actually talking about sex, right? Um, mm. Part of the reason we feel the shame and guilt is because we don't talk about it and we kind of feel it internally. But when you're in conversation with others and you realize we all feel the same way, we had similar experiences, you start to normalize it for yourself and normalize it for others. So I think it's to continue the conversations in many different you know, formats, like we're doing now, like you know, bringing a couple of your sisters together and having conversations with them. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that's why I had that question for you before about the power of, of, of sharing stories and experiences because I'm sure some you know young girl out there somewhere in you know somewhere in Africa is going to read this book and feel oh I'm not alone in feeling this way I do feel this way I have experienced this way yeah absolutely um we have another question um Okay, this is from Esther and she says, um, Nana, this is a noble idea, I love it. After you interviewed all those women and shared maybe their child sexual abuse, do you think that was uh, the start of their healing process? Because I think sharing experience has a healing power. Yeah, it's I, what yeah, I would love to think that, you know, that was a part of the healing process because yeah, I think things fester when they are sort of buried and sometimes being able to speak to somebody else and to feel heard can be an important part of the healing process. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, again, I think maybe I'm being too idealistic, but I do think that a book like this actually would be great to teach in, you know, to all the like first year university students. Um, I don't know if a lot of school boards would go for it in high school, but I <laughs> But I think in you know first year universities could be, as they're going into this adult life and this adult world and navigating dating and all these things, I think this would be a really great book. So I obviously agree one hundred percent. Yes, we need to we need to talk to university. Uh, <laughs> Maybe at least Fatimata, who is here, can get it on her university's curriculum. Yeah. That would be yes. amazing. Yeah, completely. Um, I do have another question for you, and then I think after that we have to wrap things up unless we get a few more questions. But um, I guess this is another sort of question that um, it's sort of well, basically, I, I, I want I want to sort of ask you uh, because of the you know the, the dedication of the book, you dedicate the book to your daughter and to African women and girls wherever they may be. And I just wanted to ask you, if you had the power, if somebody made you the president of Africa, and you had the power to change just one thing, whether it be a law or anything, um, in order to change and, and to make the sex lives of the next generation of African women better, what would that be? 
I think the law that I would institute will be that we have to talk to children about their bodies. We have to also help them to understand that their bodies is their own, you know, and that their bodies can be a source of pleasure for them. And, you know, nobody is allowed to abuse them or exploit them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then we have to vote for you as the president of Africa. <laughs> Let me see if I have um, another question. Um, um, so let's see what this person says. Uh, so Sakia says, uh, sorry, uh, can I ask, uh, what are the negative effects of masturbation to women or um, she says, I have never read this book and I don't have enough experience with sex. So I guess, yeah, the, that old question that we discussed earlier, I mean, people are, maybe they've been given uh, bad information about masturbation and they, they're worried and have fears about it. Yes, no, I understand that fear, you know, but there are no negative effects of masturbation. I, I feel like masturbation is very, very healthy. It's a way mm -hmm. to learn your body it's a completely safe way of having sex. You're not going to catch a, a sexually transmitted disease, for instance. You know, you figure out how to give yourself pleasure, which mm -hmm. makes it easier, I think, to teach your partner or partners how to pleasure yourself. Um, and also because I, I can see like other aspects of Zakia's question, you know, I think it's okay to feel shy about the sexual experiences you want to try. I think that's normal. I sometimes feel shy. And I think the important thing is to figure out if you really want to do it, if you feel safe with the person you're with. You know, sometimes you don't feel safe with the person you're with, and so it's hard to open up. And mm -hmm. sometimes it may be hard to speak about something, but you can do something like send a text and say, I'd like to try this and have a conversation over text. That's what I do sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've been blogging about sex for a long time, and it doesn't mean I never feel shy. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. No, and I agree with you. I think, uh, uh, you know, some people, uh, a lot, especially young people, have this idea that if only I get to this one time in my life where I, this just becomes like I become an expert. And the thing about sex is that, of course, it's, a, it's such a vulnerable thing that you're always, there's always more to learn, more to overcome, more to uh, unpack and explore. It never absolutely, ends. absolutely. And I also, we live in a world, you know, that reflects back particular images to us, right? A world that says you have to have this particular body shape. If you don't have that body shape, you might not feel beautiful. You might then feel shy when your boyfriend or your partner or your girlfriend is looking at you, right? So there's a lot of unlearning we need to do all of the time. And I think we need to also extend ourselves a lot of grace and, and be kind to ourselves and to practice being brave even when we don't feel brave, you know? I think which is also past, which is also part of how we get past or the ways in which we're socialized around sex, recognizing that we need to continue, continuously educate ourselves and, and relearn and unlearn. It's a continuous process, and I don't think it's a, you know, there's a silver bullet solution. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, I think you're uh, doing such an important job on that front when it comes to talking about it, having resources uh, where people can go, whether it's your you know, your blog or this book. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for not only taking the time to uh, speak with us today, but also for going on this journey to create this book. And now we, everybody can have this book and we can, you know, they can learn from it. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Hassan. And thank you for such an enjoyable conversation. You are actually, I believe, the first man I've been interviewed by for this book in terms of like a facilitated conversation. And people say to me a lot of the time, do men read the book, you know? So yes, I am happy that I can at least point to you <laughs> as a model of a man who has not just read the book, but publicly facilitated a conversation with me about it. Thanks so much. Okay, I don't know if I should be honored or if I should feel really sad about that, but you know. We'll <laughs> Yeah. Come yeah. on, guys. African guys, I'm talking to you. This is a great <laughs> book. I think you will get an insight into uh, the people in our lives, whether it's, you know, your, 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 your sisters, your friends, your girlfriends, and wow. what could be better than to get uh, an insight into their experiences in their lives. So you can be there for them in a, in a you know, you can have a more authentic relationship.
Thank you so much for that plug. I appreciate it. I want Colombia to make that a snippet of a video, which is what we'll share on social media. <laughs> well, again, like I said, thank you so much. And I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. And thank you to everybody who joined this and conversation. I believe there is, don't go yet. I think there's okay. be, um, somebody, uh, one of the facilitators is going to come uh -huh. on. And uh, I think we'll wrap it up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Um, I have a cold. I hope I'm sounding okay. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for moderating the session, Hassan. We are always grateful for the support that you always show our center. Uh, I really admire the place that you always ask the questions and the level of understanding of the book that you always have to help our audience understand more of why they should read a book and how best they can be able to just learn more about themselves. Um, I thank you, Nana, so much for gracing our platform today. We hope to have you again. Uh, I thank you for the insights that you have shared. I really admire your courage and uh, the boldness that you have spoken so passionately about things that, yes, society would actually say, did you really go there? Did you really go there? So um, I'm thankful for voices such as yours, and we hope to be able to see you in another session in your other book, um, just giving women um, the voice to, in essence, have therapy when you speak to them um, about the issues that they have gone through. So I thank you for that. I thank you to all our audiences for thinking out through this uh, session. We hope to um, just be with you in another session. We are also having an interesting session on the 20, 29th, I believe, on emotional intelligence, where we will be speaking more about self-care. We hope that you will register for the session and come and unwind with us. So thank you. Thank you all. Have a very wonderful day. Have a wonderful morning, whether it's morning, and we hope to see you again. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Bye. Goodbye.